when you look at a humic acid or a fulvic acid, you see nothing but a carbon source. It doesn't seem like it has anything. And yet we see some tremendous responses with the plant. You know, humic acid is in fact alkali, right? So it's not going to be your pH down. Uh, you know, you can't use humic acid to decrease your pH. With a lot of the, a lot of these biostimulants, they have very similar uh, modes of action or at least results. They are going to do things like, so tannins, when we're trying to trigger a response of something, we want to just, it's much like a vaccine, right? You want a very little amount that's going to create a big response. If you give too much, you're actually going to end up killing the plant. How are carbon sources biostimulants? Well, in this video, we're going to get into it. You're here with Mark Batwell on perfectgardens.com. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe, and make sure to check us out on our Facebook and Instagram, as well as make sure to hit the notifications here on YouTube for new upcoming videos. Let's go ahead and get into it. Make sure to check out our monthly membership. For as little as $2.99 a month, you get access now to 105 members, 2,586 photos, 274 videos, 21 files, 1,106 shared links, and much, much more. Hey guys, we're back with part two on biostimulants. This is a very big subject. A lot of things are being labeled as biostimulants. And so, like I said, in part one, we're breaking this up into three parts. So let's go ahead and dive into part two on carbon sources and what are different carbon sources and how they are now labeling them as biostimulants. So first two really, because they're fairly similar, right? Humic acid and fulvic acid. Why are they considering these to be biostimulants? You know, what's, what's interesting about, uh, you know, humic acid and fulvic acid, uh, and you can include human in that as well at the bottom mm -hmm. there. When we think of biostimulants as a category, the majority of biostimulants, over 50% of the biostimulants on the market would be humate derived products, right? Hmm. So when we look at kind of breaking it down, typically you'll have a, uh, a huge number of products that are humate, humate based. Then you've got your seaweed extracts and protein hydrolysates and amino acid type things, uh, and then your microbials. So, you know, carbon sources doesn't seem like it's a, you know, a big role, but in fact, in the, in the biostimulant market, over 50% of biostimulants on the market are carbon, carbon. sources in some, in some sense. Hmm. So, um, yeah. And just to pick on these, on these two, I mean. Yeah. Why is that? Like, why, why are some, so many drive sources becoming because, from this area? I, I think uh, when we look at uh, maybe even why biostimulants became a category for people to look at is that. When you look at a humic acid or a fulvic acid, you see nothing but a carbon source. It doesn't seem like it has anything. And yet we see some tremendous responses with the plant, whether it's nutrient uptake of, of the plant or, or seeing a lot of uh, increased translocation of nutrients. So the movement of nutrients into a plant, and then once in the plant, uh, increased and better movement of, of nutrients, increased microbial activity. Um, so once again, a little goes a long way and people have been able to measure, have a measurable response when they use humate uh, substances like humic acid and fulvic acid. So it was probably the first time that, you know, scientists started realizing that how can this brown coal essentially increase the quality and yield of, of, a, of a plant and so. It, and then from you know, there, it, it was basically the blooming of the industry of biostimulants. After that. Yeah, humates never really fit fit into that category of a fertilizer because it would be zero 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 zero. Really, it doesn't have unless it's charged. It's not going to have any nutrients. So there's nothing there except carbon, right? And that's what we're looking at. This is just carbon. How is this carbon making that big of a difference? And it does. It's it's hmm. uh, it's quite interesting. Um, you know, right did, up there, with kelp. You know, give me kelp and, and and humates, and that's what I want as my my biostimulants along with my microbes. And I've always kind of wondered, uh, as a side note, how do you make humic or fulvic acid? Do you know the that process? There's there's probably different ways of making it. I mean, the more dominant process initially was to take uh, leonardite. So leonardite is the, the the kind of the parent material of a lot of humates. And uh, it's, it's essentially the layer right above when you get coal. Um, this would be what we often refer to as brown coal, right? So it's a little softer than coal, but just a carbon product. And um, typically to produce humic acid, a lot of people will do a, a, an alkali digestion. So you'll use a, a really high pH solvent um, 
so or extractant like uh, sodium hydroxide or, or potassium hydroxide you know, something with a really high pH. And, and what happens is that anything that is broken down by the high alkali becomes humic acid. And, and you, can, you, can, you can take that off and, and you can use humic acid as a liquid. If you take that liquid and you dry it, then you have humic acid powder. And, and typically, if you have something like that and you use potassium hydroxide, your humic acid will have a little bit of K in it as well. But for the most part, it's going to come across and Typically, what you get in the market, it, it you know, humic acid is in fact alkali, right? So it's not going to be your pH down. Uh, you know, you can't use humic acid to decrease your pH. It's probably going to have a pH of probably above seven, maybe eight uh, or so. And yeah, it has uh, absolutely tremendous results in things like chelating nutrients, so holding on to nutrients to make them plant available, uh, increasing microbial activity. Uh, increasing nutrient uptake, uh, and and also to some degree stimulating the immune response uh, of a plant as well. And it sounds like cation exchange sites. Yeah, uh, but cation and anion. That's the, uh, that's the difference about it, right? Is that it's got both positively and negatively charged uh, sites. So you can hold on to an ammonia ion, and right next to it, you could have a you know a phosphate ion, right? So it's it's got that ability. And then fulvic acid. If you took the remainder of whatever didn't dissolve or break down, um, and treat that with a a strong acid. So you know sulfuric like, acid. Yeah. So uh, I, I think a lot of people would use acetic acid or. Uh, yeah, using strong strong acetic acid or something, maybe hypochloric hypochloric acid or something, or or sulfuric, uh, phosphoric maybe. Uh, but you know what what dissolves or is extracted using that high strong acid is what we call fulvic acid. Hmm. And you know that's why fulvic acid. If you've ever used the liquid of fulvic acid, it's got that kind of nice gold tan look to it, right? Mm -hmm. Your your humic acid tends to be black or brown. You know. A uh, great thing to add in drip lines and then water reservoirs and things like that. The fulvic acid has got that gold tan color. Um, it is a true acid, right? So when you when you get fulvic acid, either they've used something to bring the pH back up to maybe five, five and a half, or sometimes you'll get fulvic acids that might only be three uh, pH. And then, you know, you can use that as a pH down. Do they, so, do they make powdered fulvic? I don't think I've ever seen a powdered fulvic. I know a humic, but do they make a powdered fulvic? Yeah, uh, I know that uh, a company here in Canada called Easy Grow, uh, EZ, EZ. EZ, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we learned that yesterday, Mark. We That's learned funny. that. I know we learned that yesterday. He said the exact same thing that uh, the rest of the world doesn't say uh, EZ. Z, Z, they yeah, say they say Z. Z. Yeah, to me, a, a Z28 doesn't doesn't uh, register. I, I, a Z28. Now, so being that fulvic acid is, I, you're saying that they have to bring it up. This is why I was thinking is if there's a powder form, do people have to be aware that the powder form can increase the acidity of their soil? Or are they trying to balance that out already in the powder form as well? Like I can see there could be potential differences between a liquid form and a powder form in terms of, you know, the application, if, if they're adjusting one, is the powdered one being adjusted or how does that work? I, I think we'd have to, you know, that's a great question. And, and I would definitely look into that uh, to make sure that what you are using is at the right pH that you want. You know, one of the reasons I often will recommend uh, fulvic acid, you get a lot of blueberry growers and they're, they're often trying to reduce the pH of their soils. Uh, they often will turn to sulfur to do that. I think fulvic acid has a much better role in that, especially because a lot of fulvic acids have excessive iron as well, right? So they've got some iron added to that mm -hmm. uh, fulvic acid. And, and, and of course, you know, blueberries are, are very prone to getting iron chlorosis uh, because as the pH increases, the iron becomes less available and, um, and they need that for that, uh, you know, photosynthesis to happen. So, and then at, after that process, they, they extracted from, uh, alkaline, then they went to acidity. What's left over anything human human. That's, that's what you, that's what you're left with. And, yeah. oh, interesting. and, and that's the, as, as I think we, we called it the <laughs> undigestible of the undigestible, right? This, this is the, the core carbon. And, you know, we, we champion humic acid and fulvic acid as these amazing, chelators and yeah. holders of nutrients humans gonna hold phenomenally more it's it's um yeah there's a lot of that acid. that's how i viewed it with all my research with humic and then I, I learn about human and i'm like man this is the one i want to try because you know like you stated it holds on to a lot 
many more things and and you i can see its place in, in nature you know nature's in this all this process and what's left over is human and it's it's helping protect the soil that's kind of how I, I i look at it it's it's holding on to things potentially that you know can be moved away out of out of the system and 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 ensuring that the soil has what it the, what the plant needs and you can buy it, human, right? Or no, I, it's it's already in the I, soil. I personally, I haven't found it yet. I, I think, uh, you know, and, and you mentioned uh, John Kempf in, in a previous episode. Yeah. Uh, I know that their pro- product, uh, I believe, might even be called Humicarb. Could uh, be. But yeah. uh, that would ha- that would contain human in it. Hmm. Um, so it, it and um, arguably, if you had some amazing compost and, and, and you, you know, you don't have to, produce humic acid and fulvic acid and, and arguably human by just using leonardite as your as your starting source. You can produce humic acid and fulvic acid. Uh, humates are being produced in a, in a compost pile as well, right? It's just not extracted out in that way. And, and, and I, I spoke about, you know, two types of chemical uh, preparation of humic acid and fulvic acid. There are other sources that, that don't use a high alkali or a high uh, acid treatment. Are we talking about bone char as no. well? No, no, like linardite coal. Did you say it was? Yeah, it's a brown coal. Brown, brown coal. coal or linardite. Uh, you know, in in uh, northern Alberta is one of the largest uh, mines of of linardite that we have in the world. Ab, is that a byproduct of the coal industry? I think it it would be you know as you're mining to get to coal, uh, it's it's what you're going to hit first, right? So. You go through peat bogs and then you go into, you know, different layers. And then just before, before you hit that hard coal, you, you've, uh, you kind of hit linardite. So you're talking about the, the peat bogs, you're talking about the peat moss. Right, right. And we describe that whole process. So at the top you have peat moss and then as you work down, what does that look like? Yeah, now, now I, I, I'm going to have to say I'm not a, a geologist or in, in that sense of, of being able to but my, my understanding is you've got your your active marsh at the top or uh, your your peat bog uh, that its own living soil system or a living system and then and then below that you actually have the peat and then as you work down you know arguably brown coal is often referred to as even like a brown peat now we're getting into a harder substance hmm. this is um, leading up into black coal wow interesting it makes me go back to biochar right isn't biochar the same thing De- like decompressed wood that compacts that had large amounts of surface area and wouldn't coal isn't now coal basically yeah i i you know and i think there's there's a lot of parallels there right so but uh, biochar is usually formed uh, whether it was the terra preta of of the amazonian indigenous amazonian uh, population or it's the biochar that we make now it, it comes through incomplete pyrolysis, right? So you you don't burn lack of oxygen. You lack of oxygen, right? So so yeah. or, or it's it's incomplete. So you actually put in, uh, you know, you take out that oxygen, so you don't get a, a complete burn into ash. Very similar principle. That biochar is going to have a lot of those positively and negatively charged sites, and and be able to hold on to nutrients. The fact is that humic acid, fulvic acid, and human typically are are way we have far more sites, yeah, just right. far more uh, sites to hold. Um, and, and you know, we 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 haven't really focused on on some, yeah. The, what are the rest of them? Of them? Yeah, what are polypen nodes? Uh, much like uh, you're going to find a lot of polyphenols in you know brown algae, brown brown seaweeds. Hmm. Uh, those are often uh, what we're looking for. With a lot of the a lot of these biostimulants, they have very similar uh, modes of action or at least results. They are going to do things like increase nutrient uptake. They are going to uh, stimulate the immune system of the plant and, and usually then perhaps uh, address some stress tolerances, right? So one of the things that polyphenols can do and is, is that they um, can stimulate ability for a plant to grow through, through even some stress, whether that's a salt stress uh, or a drought stress or something. You know, for humic acid and fulvic acid, the other the other main thing that we we look for is that they seem to be also great sources for bacteria to use as as a bacteria and other 
organisms as, as a house. Yeah. So hmm. you stimulate that biological activity as well. How about the tannins? Where do you, where would you find tannins? Tan- tannins, uh, I don't necessarily, I never thought of it uh, other than, you know, when you're taking like the flora tannins in, in uh, brown seaweed, but very similar, similar function. What is it going to trigger? Is it a uh, tannin will most likely trigger your, trigger your induced systemic resistance of a plant or the, sal- uh, the systemic acquired resistance. Uh, but you'll find tannins in, in you know, leaf mold uh, as, as, as leaves are breaking down, you know, hmm. black tea, things like that, that those, are all, those hmm. all have high tannins. And once again, less is more, right? So tannins, when we're trying to trigger a response of something, we want to just, it's much like a vaccine, right? You want a very little amount that's going to create a big response. If you give too much, you're actually going to end up killing the plant. Yeah. Wow. And any products that have tannin that you know off the top of your head? Um, you, you'd find tannins, of course, in, in things like um, if you were using compost, worm castings, all of those would have tannins. Uh, seaweed extracts would have tannins. Dried seaweed would have the, uh, tannins. Yeah. So tannins wow. are just another another one of these uh, proteins within within a plant. Wow, that's so interesting. It, it sounds like we we got three more to cover, but it sounds really like biostimulants, uh, humic, fulvic, and kelp really make up biostimulants. Um, to me, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and I think uh, uh, there's definitely been one study that uh, out of Virginia. It's often quoted that um, a five to two ratio of humic acid to kelp extract uh, works phenomenally better than, than you know, a, uh, a one-to-one ratio or something like that. So what do you mean by that? Like a five to one, like five teaspoons to two teaspoons? Yeah, exactly. So if you maintain a five to one or five to two ratio, and, and so if it was five milliliters of of humic acid, uh, two milliliters of, of the kelp extract, that would be your solution that you would use. And, and supposedly, according to this uh, study at uh, West Virginia or Virginia State, it um, seemed to work the best in terms of, of being uh, serving as a biostimulant, whether that meant increased nutrient uptake, stress tolerance, uh, increased um, uh, yield. Hmm. That's yeah, that's really interesting because a lot of uh, beneficial bacteria and fungi products have, uh, I think they have humic humic um, in them already. So it makes me want to take into consideration that when I'm adding in when I'm adding them together. So, yeah. yeah. How about lignans? What are those? Yeah, so um, you know, lig- lignans are are that protein that forms that that hard woodiness uh, of your cannabidiol, right? So when your cellulose turns more woody. So the cellulose is, is when you get that nice green looking stem, that's the cellulose. We, we personally can't digest cellulose, but uh, you know, cows of course can. Lignans are the, are, are when cellulose becomes uh, woody, right? And so that's, that's what that is. In terms of, of, of where it works in as a, as a, uh, a biostimulant, I'm assuming that it's going to have very similar responses as, as like a tannin or perhaps even like human in, in, the, in the sense that it's it's a, a microbial stimulant that can help signal something within the plant. Also in kelp? Uh, tannins in kelp? Yeah, yeah, there's tannins in kelp. Oh, so, I mean the lig- lig- ligands. Oh, lignans. Um, I can't, do you, do you picture um, kelp, um, seaweeds getting really woody? Oh, yeah, no, no, absolutely not. I, so I'm thinking probably like a hardwood, like a... It, it could be any, any, like any woody substance that, that is like, right. So, I mean, uh, see, we could, I just can't picture it. Right. No, you're right. I didn't, I didn't make the connection until you said that. So now I'm thinking harder wood, wood material, which then a lot of mushroom growers use woody material to grow mushrooms. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's making me also think a little bit about that and seeing the connection with the growing mushrooms, but oh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know the connection. Well, I mean, it, it's a food source, right? So uh, we can't digest uh, lignin, but yeah, it's a great fungal food, right? Uh, that's mm. that's what dendritic uh, fungi do. They they break down wood. That's their food source. That's interesting. I, I've been watching mushroom, uh, a couple of mushroom uh, growers on YouTube, and they use different wood sources for right. different reasons. And I wasn't sure why. And I'm thinking, I'm starting to realize now it could be a better food source for the microbes, or I mean, but for the fungi. The fungi. Oftentimes, it's whatever digestive enzymes you know they have uh, 
to able to do that, right? And and you know we have to be careful because you know things like tannins. Um, you you if you were to use a a bark mulch, um, you know around your cannabis plants, and that bark mulch was relatively fresh, and it came from you know perhaps a species um, that has high high residues of tannin, you will impede it. You know really hinder growth. And, and that's been one of the biggest challenges in using hmm. bark mulch as, as a replacement for peat or cocoa is that it has a high tannin content and that tannin hmm. actually will inhibit uh, seedling emergence and, and really root, proper root growth for, for a lot of growth. So when they say wood would rob the nitrogen, that's not actually what's hurting the plant. It's the tannins on the wood that are hurting the the new um, plant. You know, the, definitely the tan, tannins are, are those, you know, exudates that are going to impact the, the, the plant, you know, in, in a negative sense that it could inhibit root growth and stuff. When, when we say that uh, it's the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So when we look at bark mulch, it may have a carbon to nitrogen ratio of a hundred to one, meaning that you've got a hundred parts of carbon and one part of nitrogen. Our soils typically have a carbon to nitrogen ratio of, of 12 to one or 15 to one. So you put that much more carbon, it is in fact going to going to start stealing your your nitrogen, right? And, the- and, and, and that's why it's important too. If you, if you get into compost, you need to make sure your carbon to I always say green or is there's a balance that you need to achieve for those reasons. So your end result is not just significantly one or the other, or the you know for the process of breaking down that compost. Yeah, you know, depending on, on on what you want to end up with, if you want a, a great compost for cannabis, you probably want a more fungal compost, right? So you're going to have a little bit more carbon in it, uh, right. even in the starting material, than you would if you were trying to feed your vegetable garden, right? Yeah. For vegetable garden, you want a you know a much lower carbon to nitrogen ratio. Hmm. That's so interesting. The last two we have lipids and fatty acids. Why are they considered biostimulants? In, in large part, uh, so, you know, lipids and fatty acids, they're, you know, we can't really call them, you know, fertilizers. What they often do is they're precursors to, to many of our primary metabolites. And so plants have the ability, and this is an amazing thing that we still don't understand fully, is that they can take up a pretty big molecule. Uh, we, we think that, you know, the, the cell wall is going to, you know, hold back what they can actually take up. But fatty acids and lipids can actually be pulled into a cell wall. And now you've got something that is um, a little bit more advanced and, and the plant can immediately turn that into a protein. Are lipids a form of fat or a form of protein or? They're, they're, they're a form of fat, right? Form of so, fat, right? Lipids are fats, right? And, and we'll often see that, you know, of course, in, in cannabis, for example, when you, when you look at cannabinoid biosynthesis, there's often, you know, lipids being used in that whole biosynthesis. And, and so if you give a plant a starter of, of a molecule, it just progresses from that. It's the same reason as we'll talk about next time around amino acids and, and what they do. That's a great, actually, probably a great place to finish up, guys. Please follow us to part three on amino acids and why they are biostimulants. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe, and make sure to check us out on our Instagram page and Facebook. Have a great grow. To me, the best way of describing a biostimulant is is to move it away from calling it a fertilizer, because in, in large practice, you are using minute amounts of this product and seeing a larger response.